Hello everyone. It's Mike Levin. September 11th, 2019. And I'm here on my way to work. And uh, thought I'd crank out another video because I've been working with the Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL 2, for a few days now. I had a few false starts in getting it running. I had to get on the Windows Insider program, and uh, I had to upgrade my previous Ubuntu 18.04, uh, which had some challenges when I uh, tried to upgrade it directly using WSL.exe. It reported back some errors about something having to do with the virtual machine. So it turned out I had to export it and then import it again. <clears throat> and uh, once I did that, I found myself logging in as root. And you know, there's Linux ways to change your uh, login script and change who you're logged in as, but that didn't make sense. All this is supposed to be a nice clean experience. So I researched it and found I had to hack the registry find the entry for the default user, change it to what happens to be the first user I set up, user 1000, uh, from the default of one, which is root. <clears throat> they say they're gonna be fixing that, but at any rate, right now, I have now both WSL1 and WSL2 running, and can uh, do a comparison, and I have for graphics, which I, I generally resist, I am of the same exact school as Microsoft, Linux on Windows is mostly about developer tools and the command line. But because of some of the architecture changes they've made from the Windows script host from being, I guess, tightly coupled with Windows to being more of using the, uh, the virtual machine system that's built in, uh, something called hypervisor to allow two different machine kernels, Windows and Linux, to run side by side and to sort of blend together seamlessly. There's more resource isolation. So they went from <clears throat> uh, the, the Linux system using the IP and the network configuration of the host machine to it having its own virtual uh, network. I guess it's more of a QEMU, which is another virtual machine system out there where a local virtual LAN, local area network is set up. The machines are assigned their own IPs on your virtual network. And so the IP of the Windows uh, machine is not used by the child, which I guess it should be side by side by the uh, Linux machine. And so, VPN on the host machine. I happen to use VPN to be able to access work resources is suddenly cut off from Linux. So I have them both running uh, WSL 1 and 2. So I just pop back to WSL 1 right now to uh, do the remote login work on the uh, you know Amazon servers and stuff. But that's not a good situation and I know I can wait it out and Microsoft will fix that. But the VPN I'm using does have a command line interface, but you get it, it appears after you install the uh, it through the graphics interface. So interestingly, you need a Linux desktop or graphics subsystem running in order to install this particular VPN software then you configure it and then you can use the command line tools and stay in the uh, text only interface, which is what I normally use for Linux. And I'm sure there's other workarounds, but this is the price of being on the bleeding edge. So I am mildly curious about how graphics on Linux on Windows works. And I have attempted to do it in the past with some uh, varying degree of uh, success. So most recently, I made sure that I had uh, it all set up, which involves a program called XLaunch, 
which gives you an X server uh, in combination with a program. They get installed at the same time, really, but VCX SRV, one of the worst program names ever created, but nonetheless, you can have uh, what's called an X server running quietly and invisibly in the background so that when you launch graphics programs from the Linux subsystem, they come up with a full user interface. And there's various ways to do this. You can launch it so that it comes up in a window on Windows, which is very elegant. And things like Chrome, I launch that way. I'm, you know, this is all about Chrome, by the way. This is all about being able to control Chrome headlessly as part of my career. Uh, so I use Linux for development and I have a great Windows laptop. I've got the um, Mac, uh, it's not Mac, it's the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the uh, book, the, uh, oh, it's right in here. They, these names, it's clearly it was named to uh, PowerBook, PowerBook 2, Surface Book, Surface Book 2. Um, it's an excellent portfolio shaped, not even a laptop. Some people think it's a turnoff, but now after uh, nearly two years on it, a year and a half, I love the thing. It's a, a superior design. Microsoft is doing well with hardware and I wanted to be on a piece of hardware I could be on for years and years and uh, allow my muscle memory to develop. So I paid a little extra, got top of the line laptop. It's Windows 10 and uh, Microsoft is really going out of its way to make the Windows 10 experience a good one. So I want to be on the best desktop and you know Linux people you know might say oh Linux desktop Ubuntu desktop get a, a laptop that works really well with it this has all the drivers supported but uh, I got to be on Windows 10 for a variety of reasons just professional reasons you know you don't want to be an outlier you want to be compatible with everyone around you so on the office side and the marketing side you want to be a windows person doing windows things and being very familiar with that and on the development side you want to be on linux uh, doing linux command line things and one thing that is the black sheep in the whole picture is linux desktops don't particularly want them don't particularly need them and uh because i need a graphic subsystem for chrome Ah, it's in for a penny and for a pound. I can kick the tires of the different uh, uh, Linux desktops. So, <clears throat> so far I have, I think they call XVCE. There's, there's a really lightweight one that I have running. Uh, I have, of course have Ubuntu desktop running. It's running Unity interestingly, and I'm having difficulty switching to GNOME on uh, Ubuntu 18.04, but I, I have Unity running, and one of the little nuanced details is that the <clears throat> excuse me, the X server software needs to be switched from shared window mode, where the windows are shared with Windows, to full screen mode. And it's a little bit odd because when you run an X server in full screen mode without actually launching the full screen program you intend, it comes up with a solid black screen. And then you have to use alt windows to move around and you launch your uh, Unity desktop and <clears throat> comes up full screen. I show that a little in the prior video. And uh, yeah, so one of the key differences, given that the new subsystem uses a real virtual machine, uh, architecture and the old one was more tightly coupled with a windows desktop pluses minuses clearly in the long term microsoft wants to move to the virtual machine uh, scenario which by the way has kick-ass performance it has it's nothing like the vmware uh experience of uh memory you know being tied up and uh having like a second computer of course once you launch your Unity desktop, it might feel that way a little bit, or your uh, Linux desktop of any sort, because two different desktops. But so long as you're just using the Linux graphic subsystem so that things come up on your Windows desktop, like Chrome, yeah, 
it's no different from running Windows software. The performance is good. Uh, the user interface looks a little bit different. You know, you're getting, uh, it might be QT. I'm not sure what user interface, uh, you know, it's not Naked X Windows, which looks really uh, bare bones. They're using something. There's a few different ones out there. A lot of people are uh, settling in on what's called the QT, uh, I guess, visual component library for building user interfaces. So it looks pretty good and it looks fairly integrated with Windows. And uh, it doesn't feel like you're using a virtual machine at all. And so that's great. When I do development work that pops up Chrome for Chrome automation under Linux scripts, it happens and I can watch Chrome and watch it for debugging and stuff. I'm gonna have to delve a little bit more into the into JavaScript in order to use the Puppeteer library. The Chrome automation right now is only supported under JavaScript. And I'm doing more things uh, under Google Spreadsheets, so I might need to take up JavaScript a little bit more for app script in there. And uh, yeah, so can't get away from JavaScript. I like to promote myself as Linux, Python, Vim, and Git, the core uh, tools, the four things you'll uh, you could make a career of for the rest of your life that satisfies the 80-20 rule. But just like, uh, you know, you couldn't get away from the basic programming language in the past and just the way PostScript became the, you know, preeminent display technology for years, you can't get away from JavaScript because the web browser built it in and a bunch of things like uh, Google chose it for their embedded uh, app scripting language. So uh, Linux, Python, Vim, and Git, and uh, the honorary throw out to uh, JavaScript, and uh, also Jupyter Notebook, which I always qualify that as. And uh, so my uh, development platform is definitely undergoing its next step of uh, evolution, uh, wherein I'll probably have all of uh, Anaconda and Jupyter Notebook installed under the Windows script host. Not sure if I'm gonna use a desktop interface, but it sure feels like uh, the old Amiga computer days. You know, things are getting a little bit uh, hacky on uh, Windows. Uh, of course, I'm on the Windows Insider program and I'm experiencing a lot of things that uh, is not intended for public popular consumption yet. Um, so I'm on the bleeding edge, exactly where I have resisted wanting to be for a long time. I certainly have gone the not uh, Linux desktop uh, path so that I would always either be on Windows or Mac desktops and be compatible with the rest of the world. Uh, delved into Macs for many years. I was very happy that it was based on Unix which is very much like Linux, the predecessor, the precursor to Linux. And it gave a, a nice familiar feel, but it didn't have a great software repository. And you had to go looking around for things like Homebrew or Mac OS or Fink. And you were right back in that old hacky world that you wanted to get away from by choosing a mainstream platform. And uh, Windows, Microsoft, in partnering with Ubuntu, uh, or partnering with Canonical, the company that makes Ubuntu, they have the clearly most popular version of Linux, uh, which comes with the most popular software repository, the Ubuntu software repository, which is built upon or derived from the Debian software repository, which is a variation of Linux that was made so that installing software was easy and that resolving dependencies was easy. And uh, it broke off from the main direction of Linux that was trying to stay compliant, as compliant as possible with Unix, uh, where you have Red Hat and CentOS and a variety of other Linuxes that use a different software repository system called RPM. Uh, some people know it as Yum. Um, the Ubuntu people know this software repository as the apt-get uh, program, or the synaptic, I believe it's called, under the graphical user interface. Synapse, perhaps? Well, at any rate. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm uh, arriving at the terminal. I'll uh, be wrapping this up really soon. And uh, yeah, so the two different Linux subsystems, one being tightly integrated with Windows, the other being using the virtual machine system. And I was trying to get to the virtual machine system, WSL2, in the hopes that Chrome would run more cleanly and elegantly on the desktop without all these special configuration things to turn off sandbox mode. And, you know, it was really hard to get things to work under the tightly coupled system because it was different. Linux, things ran differently under Linux. The programs could tell it wasn't a default Linux environment. So success, uh, as you saw demonstrated in the prior video, you'll probably be seeing a lot more of that. Uh, the Chrome automation stuff I do is uh, coming uh, together now, finally, so I can develop scripts on the Linux subsystem for win Windows that automates the Chrome web browser with graphics turned on so I can see the browser pop up and do its little automated bits for the debugging stage, and then I turn off the showing of the graphics, which is called headless mode, and put that script exactly as I wrote it over onto a lightweight, headless, cheap, cloud-based Linux server. Set it to schedule, bam, I'm capturing screen snapshots, I'm doing search engine results tracking, I'm doing any of the many other things that you may want to do uh, running as a Chrome browser user rather than one of these many tools that you can use or the built-in HTTP tools. A lot of people use the request library for this under Python. A lot of people use curl under a variety of languages. Um, most languages have it built in these days, but you use a third-party package like requests or curl to get a clean user interface, something a little bit more friendly. And so my third party thing you now for making these requests is actually Chrome itself. Uh, actually Chromium right now. Uh, it might stay Chromium, but Chromium is the free and open source version of Chrome where a lot of this stuff reaches first. So once again, being on the bleeding edge and uh, that's pretty much it. I'm at the terminal now. So I wanted to report in on my positive success of getting Windows script host Windows yeah, I used to use WSH, Windows Script Host, in the long, long ago. Uh, I wanted to report in on my success with the Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL 2.0. Currently part of the Insider build and uh, running Chrome in graphics mode uh, on the desktop of Windows um, in a very automatable way. Uh, as uh, I was hoping, big step forward. So uh, thanks for joining me. Hope to talk to you again soon. And don't forget to subscribe.